Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Every Sunday in the Episcopal Church, we say that we believe in Jesus. And today, in a variety of forms in our liturgy of baptism and receptions and reaffirmation, this we believe in Jesus theology, if you will, is written throughout what we will be saying together. Let me begin first, before I go any further, saying that I will uh, not do justice to this Jesus that we believe in in this very short sermon that you're praying for right now, because this is really long. I mean, this is so long, you all. I tried to cut it down, but it's not. But uh, just to say, even then, I want to cover it all. Uh, Like, I'm not going to get into the Son of God, the begottenness stuff, the light from light stuff, etc., etc. You know, there's just a lot there. I mean, there's a lot. And so uh, today I want to focus in on uh, on just the human person of Jesus. And that's not the end all and be all of things. Uh, But, um, and I do have another thing I need to say, which is right now you're very excited, hoping that I will confirm some of your favorite theories about Jesus uh, that you've been holding for some time. And you know what? I am so interested in what you think about Jesus. But unfortunately, I have to leave right after the service. And so we've got this great priest here who will answer all of the questions <laughs> and will correct everything that I say that is wrong. And uh, because you are fortunate to fortunate enough to arrive on the fifth Sunday of my preaching on the Nicene Creed here, uh, uh, you won't get the sixth, seventh, and eighth. You're going to have to listen online. Uh, but that also means that who knows what scriptures get picked for me, and these are hard given what I'm about to say. I just want to note that. The church complain, uh, proclaims, the church probably complains about this too. The church proclaims, and I do believe in this Jesus. And that this Jesus that we talk about all the time, and that I want to talk about today, was a fully human being. We might think of this in some way as the pre-Easter Jesus, though we could go into blah, 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 and a lot of theological stuff I'm not going to talk about. Uh, But this statement doesn't exhaust the full understanding about how his body, mind, soul, imagination worked, right? I mean, you just is so much. Uh, But this human Jesus, the human, and that's really what I'm talking about today. This human Jesus was, the church believes, and I believe, a historical person. Okay, it's not, this is not a myth for the church. Jesus was a very real human being. We believe that he was indeed born to Mary and Joseph. And before you run off on all of that other business that comes with that, I'm not talking about that either. But I want to say that it's important. This is the sermon here is what I'm not talking about. That's the title. This, what I want to under, you to understand, though, is Jesus was a Jewish man from Nazareth. And today, I think it's important for us to remember that particular fact. He was not a white Anglo-Protestant man living in America who wrote the Bible And the last book of the Bible, the U.S. Constitution. That is not (laughs) who we're talking about today. Okay, I just I want to be clear and up front. And I don't think I think most Episcopalians would find that actually true. Jesus was from Nazareth. He was Jewish, uh, and that is testified throughout uh, the witnesses. And we know that he had reached an age where he knew the Torah very well, as was the tradition at the time. 
So he knew his scripture. He knew his scripture. There might be some debate over what scriptures he liked the best, blah, 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 blah. But he knew his scripture, and we also know that his teaching style was one of proclamation, particularly of the good news of a saving God. And this seems key to understanding his person. He understood God as a God who freed people, who heard their cry and freed them because God loved them, because God chose them, because God had created them. Jesus related, we believe, to this loving God. And we might remember his own reading that he chose for the synagogue was appointed, if it may be for him to read, but it's obvious that with some great power he proclaimed that God, this God of love, was a God for the prisoners and for the hungry and for the poor. This seems to have great power and meaning to those who followed him. And importantly, I would argue that this Jesus implicitly claimed for himself that he was a sage, that he was a wise man, that the Spirit not only was fulfilling things in his time on earth, but the Spirit was upon him and upon his work. And that's an important insight onto this human Jesus, that he believed that he was not just horizontally connected to all people, but deeply and profoundly connected to the God above. And uh, that that, I would say, is not, though, the revelation of who Jesus was as a human being. The revelation actually is in the words that he taught. It's in the things that he did. The people who followed him in that close-knit group saw a dynamism in him that was unlike any other sage or rabbi of the time. They saw something unique in this human person. We would say that it was proclamation, dynamic. Theolo theologians say it was charismatic. It was a living word that they were perceiving from this, this man. For Jesus spoke as if he spoke on behalf of God. That's one of the things that got him in trouble. He started forgiving sins and doing all kinds of stuff. People were like, what? He can't do that. Only God does that. But that's how intimate this human Jesus felt his relationship was. And so as they looked at Jesus, they saw a person, not an individual standing outside of time and history, but rather a person located in a moment of oppression and great poverty in the midst of their context, and that this human Jesus, through the profundity of his words, was deeply connected in the line of great prophets, Moses and Abraham and even Isaiah, that he he was in that line. They weren't sure yet what was going to happen, but they knew that in this human Jesus, there was that. And after all, think of the stories. People crowded around just to listen, just to listen to him. People came and reached out. The, uh, the testimony of Philip, which says, hey, we found the person we've been looking for. Or we might think of those who brought the ill and the infirm to him so much so that when the people had filled the house, they dropped one of them through the roof to get to Jesus. They're not talking about some kind of mystical. They want that human Jesus to lay hands on them. Think of the woman who reaches out so terrified of the power perhaps and needing healing. She reaches out to grab this human Jesus. And here's where we begin to understand that he is living a life of love and compassion and power in the world. That his forgiveness and mercy and grace does not stand alone, but is part of the continuous revelation of the God from the beginning of the world. Paul writes in his letter that they understood him as son of God, son of man, and that he was offering love and comfort not to any one group of people, says Paul, but to all people. 
that this human Jesus was teaching that God had made all people and that God loved all people. <laughs> Period. And that that was radical. So radical is it, Paul says, that everyone inherits from the very beginning the tradition of God. Everyone has that inheritance. We are the inheritance of Abraham, Paul says. Now, you might read the scriptures that we had today because they are terrible scriptures. And Bonnie is ready to answer all your questions. Like I said. <laughs> But think about this, because you might be thinking, well, okay, this is all really nice, like looking back stuff, okay? But think about Jonah, right? Now, some of you know this story about Jonah, and you know about the whale, right? Jonah and the whale get swallowed up, and it was a great story. If you haven't ever read it, you should go read it right now. But I'm not going to talk about the whale, and I'm not going to talk about serving. Why doesn't Jonah do what God asked him to do? He's supposed to go to Nineveh. And tell him to repent, right? Remember that part of the story? It's supposed to go and it's supposed to like go. And what does Jonah do? No, right? You're following me right there. He's like, no, he's not going. He's going to go get in that whale tunnel, right? So he doesn't go. Why doesn't he go? Oh, Lord, I don't want to go to Nineveh because you're going to do what you always do. They're going to repent and say they're sorry, and you are going to forgive them. And I don't want any part of that silliness. Right? That's the point of the story of Jonah. Is that we humans are like the second steward in the story. We want, you know, come rain down upon them. They are enemies. They have, oh, they've offended the Lord so much. This is rain down. And God says, I love them. I love them. I love you. And that is a radical message that this human Jesus brings. Love your enemies. What? That was a countercultural statement then as it is today. Witness Jesus does to this love in such a powerful, powerful way through his own wisdom and compassion and his acts of mercy, his acts of peacefulness. Peter, put away that sword. We will not fight tonight, he says. He goes willingly and dies not victorious, but as a criminal upon the cross for all people. And that's when people realized something else was happening, right? Think of the centurion standing there watching that happen. And the centurion says what? Truly, this was a man of God, right? Like all of a sudden, when he doesn't do the things that the powers of the world expect him to do, but dies instead of cross, on the cross, he changes, he changes the way we think. So yes, Riley and you all will remind ourselves today, you are born into the resurrection of Christ. You are. For another sermon, I'm not going to talk about that today. But you also will hear the words that you're buried with Christ in his death, in his humanness in this humanness that he shares with us and offers to us as an example. So the church believes in a very human historical Jesus who was very powerful, as I've said, a real, prophetic, revelatory, loving, empowering human being. And the truth is, if you don't start there, it's really hard to get the rest of the story. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.